Hi guys, welcome to another podcast. Uh, in this podcast, we'll be taking a look at introduction to sound waves. Um, so we've talked about different types of waves in chapter 12, um, mostly in general, and now we'll start to take a look um, at specifically how do sound waves behave. So let me remind you uh, some guidelines of what makes for good podcast listening. You want to make sure that you're listening and following along carefully, so don't try not to be doing anything else while you're listening. You can use your book. Most of the stuff from this uh, section, this podcast, is going to be found um, on 479 through 486 in your book, so this is 13.1. Again, you want to pause and check in frequently. Uh, you can take notes if you want to, uh, but make sure you really understand what's going on, and then... I strongly recommend watching this multiple times to make sure that you really understand what's going on so you can come into class and be able to discuss and apply this stuff very quickly. You should be able to do these four things. Explain how sound waves are produced, so where do they come from, how are they made. Relate frequency to pitch, so we've talked about frequency in the previous chapter and now we're going to try to relate that to what is this idea of pitch. Compare the speed of sound in various media, meaning how does sound travel in water versus air or metal versus air. And then we're also going to talk about the Doppler effect, so determining the direction of a frequency shift. So how does frequency change when there's relative motion between a source and an observer? So basically when something is coming towards you or moving away from you, how does that change the sound? So first, how do we make sound, or how is sound made? Well, this tuning fork is going to provide us an example, but the basic idea is that you have something that's vibrating, and it compresses air or something else and transmits waves. So it's something that will compress or change the size, squish something or stretch something out, uh, and moves waves at certain frequencies. The first part of that is compression. So the first part, you can see the ends of the tuning fork getting closer together. That's compression. And then the second half of that motion is called rarefaction. And the object moves back and leaves a space for air to return. And so you get this pattern of some, the air being compressed and then released, compressed and then released. Um, and that's how the sound waves are made and they travel from there. Let me get you another look at what's going on there. So in, uh, in close-up, here's your tuning fork that's vibrating back and forth. And in the first part, it's compressing the air, and so you get a dense part, and then it moves back in rarefaction, and you get this space where there's a very low density of air. So that happens um, over and over again, and that's how you get those traveling sound waves. And so again, if we take a, diff a slightly different look, you can see that sound waves are periodic, meaning that they are occurring over and over again, and they're longitudinal. So remember, longitudinal waves are the same thing as compression waves or density waves from chapter 12. So you can see these areas of high and low density if you look at the graph uh, below. That's what sound waves tend to look like. And so you get compression forming those high density areas and rarefaction forming those low density areas. So here's one of the most important concepts uh, when we discuss sound, is how do we perceive sound? And one of the ways that we perceive sound is through its frequency, and we call that pitch. So as humans, we interpret the frequency of sound waves as pitch, and that's how high or low the sound is perceived to be. So you've probably heard of high-pitched things or low-pitched things. When you have a very high-pitched thing, that means that you're hearing a high frequency of sound waves, so a, a soprano's voice, so something way up high like, Oh, this is a high-frequency voice! And then if you hear something that's low-pitched, you're hearing or you're interpreting something that's at a low frequency, so a very low voice that sounds like this. So this is a low-frequency voice. And so that's, that's how your ear interprets and that's how your brain interprets those signals uh, that you get from the air vibrating around you. High pitch is high frequency, low pitch is low frequency. Humans can hear between about 20 hertz, meaning something that vibrates 20 times per second, to something that vibrates about 20 at 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz. 
Um, and that's sort of the maximum range. Uh, you can probably hear somewhere between, uh, somewhere in there, but not necessarily up to those numbers. Um, and just a reminder that pitch is a subjective thing, meaning that that's what we interpret the sound to be. Um, but we're not necessarily always accurate, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about the Doppler effect. Um, but what we hear as sound is just, you know, what our brain interprets. Um, you know, that's sort of how our body is wired. And that can sometimes be different than the sound's actual frequency. So we'll talk about that more when we talk about the Doppler effect. So let me talk for a little bit about inaudible waves, uh, meaning things that we cannot hear. Uh, one of the things that happens as we get older is we can hear less and less of a range of frequencies. So I can hear less well than you, not necessarily in terms of volume, uh, but in terms of the frequencies that I can hear. So I will have a much less successful range of hearing than you will. If you take a second to click on that link, and if you can't click on it, uh, just type it into your browser, um, copy it down and type it in. Uh, there's a sound frequency test where you can actually see where does your hearing start in terms of the frequency range. Uh, mine starts at about 14.1 kilohertz or about 14,000 hertz. Uh, I bet yours starts probably much higher. So give that a shot. I'll warn you, it's an annoying sound, so you may want to turn your speakers down a little bit. The other piece I wanted to bring up, we can use sound waves that we can't hear for other purposes. So one of the things you've probably heard of before is ultrasonic waves. That just means sound waves that are at a higher range that we can't, uh, we can't hear. You've probably heard of dog whistles. Dog whistles operate at a higher uh, frequency than we can hear, but dogs can still hear. Um, but we sometimes use them to see the insides of objects as well. Um, and if you take a second to guess, I bet you've heard something like ultrasonic before. Uh, and that's where we get this idea of ultrasounds. Uh, we can use them to peer inside of things that we otherwise wouldn't be able to see. Um, other practical applications are things like bridges and airplane wings, things where really small cracks occur or really small divisions where we want to be able to see, you know, is this bridge safe or is this plane safe? We'll take ultrasonic waves and bounce them and see if we can get a picture of what's going on inside. So just like other types of waves, sound waves travel from a point and they spread out. And so they spread out in three dimensions, um, but we can take a look at them in two dimensions. So in reality, they look something like this, where they travel from a point and they get bigger and bigger in these sort of ever-expanding sheets. But we can look at them as sort of like a top-down view in two dimensions where there's a source of sound um, and then they expand out from this sound. And so a couple of pieces of terminology here. These circles represent the highest density or the highest concentration of sound. So those are the compression parts. Um, and then inside, somewhere in the middle, would be the rarefaction. And we call those the wave fronts. So we sort of define sound waves as from compression to compression, and each, each area of high density is a wave front. And those fronts look kind of like planes in three dimensions. So you can imagine sort of an ever-expanding plane uh, from the middle or from the source of sound, and that's called a plane wave. So they travel in sort of these big moving sheets of sound, um, and those are plane waves. And then, not surprisingly, the distance between each wave front is a wavelength. So you can see up here, this is a wavelength, and so here's a front, and here's a front, and here's a front. And so there's wavelengths between each front, and how often those fronts arrive, or how often those plane waves arrive, tells you the frequency of the sound. We talked about a little bit in the previous chapter that wave propagation depends on what medium it's traveling through, and the same is true of sound. So sound is going to travel faster or slower, uh, depending on what medium it's going through. There's a chart in your book on page 482, it looks like this, and it tells you the speed of sound in that particular medium. Um, and so you have gases and liquids and solids, and you should start to notice a couple of things. One is that solids are going to let sound travel much, much faster, um, for the most part, than liquids and gases. Uh, and that's because the particles are more closely packed together. 
So you're talking about particles bumping into each other. If the particles are mostly packed together, or more closely packed together, that will mean that sound can, those particles can bounce off each other more quickly. You'll also notice that temperature is going to have a difference. So sound is going to travel faster through the air when the air is 100 degrees Celsius versus when it's 0 degrees Celsius. And that's because that the particles are going to be able to collide more frequently. So remember that hotter things have particles that are moving faster around. So if they're moving faster, the particles are going to be able to hit each other more often or more frequently. As far as solids, the temperature, the particles are so closely packed together that temperature tends not to make a difference. You'll notice all the way down here, vulcanized rubber uh, has a very, very slow speed of sound. And my belief is that's because the particles are so packed together uh, that they almost can't move at all. Uh, but I could be incorrect about that, so I'm not exactly sure why rubber allows sound to travel so slowly through it. Here's our last piece. You've probably heard of the Doppler effect before, or maybe you heard of, you've heard of Doppler radar. The Doppler effect is when you hear a change in frequency based on relative motion. So if something's coming towards you or something's moving away from you, you hear a change in frequency. And here's a really good example. So what you can hear or what you can see is that as the car is coming towards you, the car horn has a certain sound. And then as it goes, or after it's passed you, then it has a different sound. So as it's coming towards you, it has a, a higher pitch. And then right as it passes you, it switches. And then it has a lower pitch. Let's hear that one more time. So here's our high pitch. And then it passes you, and now there's a low pitch there. So what's really going on? Well... As the object moves towards an observer, or if an observer is moving towards an object, but there's some relative motion, those sound waves arrive more frequently, and so you get a higher pitch. So if you look at person A, the car is moving toward person A, so those sound waves are coming faster than they otherwise would, so you get a higher pitch than there normally would be. And I want to make a point of saying that the actual frequency of vibration or the actual frequency of the car horn doesn't actually change. So if you were sitting in the car, you wouldn't notice that the car horn is getting higher or lower because it isn't to you. You're in the same you're moving the same speed as the sound waves normally would. You if you take a look at person B, the car's moving away from person B and so the sound waves are arriving less frequently than they otherwise would. And so you get a lower pitch sound if you're person B than you otherwise normally would. So person B hears a lower sound than person A, even though the car horn is making the same sound it always does. So this is called the Doppler effect, this change in frequency uh, based on the change in motion. And I want to be very clear, that only occurs with moving objects. So it's only when the car is moving towards person A that the person A hears a higher pitch. It's not that the car is closer, it's that the car is moving closer to person A. So you'll notice that if you sit closer to the computer, it's not that the computer gets to be a higher pitch when you're sitting closer, but if you are rapidly moving as you're moving closer to your computer or to your phone, then the sound would get higher as you're moving away from something or something's moving away from you, the sound gets lower. But it's not because you are closer, it's because you're moving closer. That's an important distinction. So that's the content for 13.1, the introduction to sound waves. You should be able to, at this time, talk about how sound waves are made, discuss the relationship between frequency and pitch, how they're similar and how they're not, we talked about how fast does sound travel through some objects compared to other objects or other media. And we talked about the Doppler effect, how and why it occurs. If you can talk intelligently about all of those things, then you're set to go. If you need to review a couple of those things, then you should go back, take a second, watch the video again, and see if you can do it again.